Welcome to Vintage SF. I'm Richard Rempel. Today, part two of a three-part series on the Science Fiction Hall of Fame Short Stories, Volume 1, 1929 to 1964, edited by Robert Silverberg. Just a quick reminder about how this anthology came to be. In 1965, the Science Fiction Writers of America was established and the Nebula Awards began to be awarded. Science fiction from before 1964, therefore, did not have a Nebula Award. The SFWA pulled its members for stories from before 1964 that should be recognized in an anthology. The nominations range from 1929 to 1964. They voted on them, Robert Silverberg edited, and here we have a collection of 26 stories by 26 authors. In the first video, we had an introduction to the series, and I looked at the first six stories. Today, we're going to look at the next 10 stories, and in the third video, we'll conclude with the final 10 stories and my own conclusions. So today's stories are A.E. Van Vogt, The Weapon Shop from 1942, Louis Paget, Mimsy Were the Borough Groves from 1943, Clifford D. Cimac, Huddling Place, 1944, Frederick Brown, Arena, 1944, Murray Leinster, First Contact, 1945, Judith Merrill, That Only a Mother, 1948, Cordwainer Smith, Scanners Live in Vain, 1948, Ray Bradbury, Mars is Heaven, 1948, Cyril M. Kornbluth, The Little Black Bag, 1950, and Richard Matheson, Born of Man and Woman, 1950. Our first story is by A.E. Van Vogt from 1942. I live in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, and at the time that this story was written, so did A.E. Van Vogt. The Weapon Shop was published in the December 1942 issue of Astounding Science Fiction. A businessman named Farah faces mounting professional and personal problems, despite his devotion to the empress who rules the solar system. He is infuriated when a weapons shop which sells fantastic technology, but which is not controlled by the empress, materializes in his town. He fails to rally people to get the shop expelled. Is the weapons shop an illegal organization? How come the authorities are overlooking it? What are the rules to purchase a weapon, to use a weapon? Is there actually a resistance to the empress? This story explores the humiliation of a man losing everything, coming to his wit's end. Can he find meaning and a purpose again? A.E. Van Vogt has a weird and wonderful way of driving plots forward. Not everything makes sense, but you willingly go along for the ride. There are some who say he is a precursor or a model for Philip K. Dick. Our next writer, Louis Paget, is actually a pseudonym for a married couple, Henry Cutner and Catherine Lucille Moore, each a great science fiction writer on their own. But together, they take it up a notch. The title, Mimsy Were the Borogoves, quotes a verse from Jabberwocky, a poem found in the novel Through the Looking Glass by Lewis Carroll. In the far future, a scientist is attempting to build a time machine. He tests it by sending a box of educational toys that he's quickly gathered into the ancient past. The box fails to return. He tries again with another box of toys, and it also fails to return. Believing that the experiment is a failure, he gives up. But we know that one box arrives in the middle of the 20th century, and the second in the latter part of the 19th century. One box of toys arrives in 1942 and is discovered by a 7-year-old boy named Scott. He takes it home and he and his two-year-old sister play with the toys. But remember, these are educational toys from the future. Their minds are molded in ways not of their time. The desperate parents seek professional help as their children change. The Jabberwocky poem, written by Lewis Carroll years before, becomes a template of sort for the children. We discover then that the second box of toys ended up with Lewis Carroll. This beautifully written story is a haunting piece of science fiction. Huddling Place by Clifford D. Cimac 
was originally published in the July 1944 edition of Astounding Science Fiction. It is one of several stories that are collected in City. In the distant future, humans have colonized Mars and live an apparently easy life supported by efficient and intelligent robots. Martians coexist with the humans on that planet. On Earth, humans live in isolated enclaves. Our protagonist, Jerome Webster, is a human living on Earth. He suffers from progressive agoraphobia, fear of open places. He learns that a Martian friend, a brilliant philosopher, has contracted a terrible disease that only he can cure. It would require traveling to Mars, something his agoraphobia makes nearly impossible. His friend is an important person, and his death could be a tragedy from which humankind would suffer for thousands of years. Will he be able to overcome his irrational fears and go to Mars? My friends Ira and Matt and myself review the best of different authors. Our next story was in the collection The Best of Frederick Brown. I'll have a link in the description to this video to that video. You'll find a much more detailed discussion about the story in that video. Arena was published in the June 1944 issue of Astounding Science Fiction magazine. There's a conflict between Earth and the mysterious alien outsiders. Massive armadas from both sides are set to meet just outside the solar system. Bob Carson, a pilot in one of the small one-man scout ships, blacks out while engaging with an outsider counterpart. He wakes up, naked, in a small enclosed circular area about 250 yards across. Most of the objects in this arena are blue, and the arena is, according to Carson, unbearably hot, with no available water. In the distance is an outsider. Carson labels him a roller because its form is a red sphere about one yard in diameter, and it has a dozen thin retractable tentacles. They hear the voice of an ancient intelligence, the fusion of an entire race which has intervened with this war. Carson and the outsider will fight to the death and decide the war. This single combat in the arena is outside the normal flow of time. The loser will doom its fleet to instant destruction. This is a story of strategy. In some way, it reminds me of David and Goliath, each representing their armies in the biblical story. If it sounds familiar, you may have also seen an episode of Star Trek that was loosely based on this story. You'll see Frederick Brown's name in the credits. First Contact by Murray Leinster was first printed in the May 1945 issue of Astounding Science Fiction. An exploration ship from Earth is approaching the Crab Nebula when it detects another ship on its radar. The crews, one human and one alien, establish communication, but both realize they have a problem. Neither can leave without ensuring that the other cannot track them back to their home planet. This presents a diabolical dilemma. Do you destroy them? What happens then if you meet the alien species again in space? If you don't, maybe they will destroy you. In fact, in their negotiations, they acknowledge that they can let neither of their ships go back to their home worlds. Leinster has created a very intriguing puzzle. Judith Merrill's story, That Only a Mother, was first published in Astounding Science Fiction in June of 1948. The story is set in the midst of World War III. There has been extensive use of nuclear weapons. The first part of the story is letters from pregnant Margaret to her husband Hank, a technical lieutenant on assignment. Margaret expresses fear of giving birth to a mutant. There are disturbing stories of infanticide by fathers of deformed babies. Her daughter is born. She names her Henrietta. She is extremely precocious, speaking in complete sentences by the time she first meets her father at the age of 10 months. Margaret dotes on her daughter and thinks she is wonderful, but there might be something wrong. What will Hank do? Cordwainer Smith, pen name of American Paul Leinbarger, who literally wrote the book on psychological warfare, wrote our next story, Scanners Live in Vain. It was first published in Fantasy Book Volume 1, Number 6, January 1950. 
Conscious humans cannot travel through space because of an effect called the great pain of space, which eventually causes death. So space travel is possible only in artificial hibernation. Ships are crewed by Habermans, and they are supervised by scanners, both of them who've undergone a surgical procedure to sever all sensory nerves, rendering them unable to hear, smell, or feel, although they can still see. Scanners and Habermans make travel possible in space. Theirs is a time-honored guild, but their guild is threatened by the possible discovery of a way for ordinary men to be able to travel consciously through space. What happens if they become obsolete? This story was the first story in Smith's Instrumentality of Mankind, a future history of mankind. Much of his short story output was in this universe. Mars is Heaven is a short story by Ray Bradbury, originally published in the fall 1948 issue of Planet Stories. You may know it better as one of the stories in the Martian Chronicles. A third exploratory spaceship from Earth is landing on Mars. The crew is shocked to find a small Midwest-type town similar to those they'd left on Earth. The strangely familiar people in the town believe it's 1926. Crew members begin to discover old friends and deceased relatives in the town. Is Mars heaven? Or what is happening? The Little Black Bag is by Cyril M. Kornbluth, and it was first published in the July 1950 edition of Astounding Science Fiction. This was a story that I've never read before, and I was thoroughly entertained. A physician's black bag from 2450 AD is sent back in time. The bag is found by an alcoholic physician who is no longer practicing medicine. At first, he wants to see if he can pawn the black bag. But as he starts to discover the extraordinary properties of the medical instrument and drugs, he changes his mind. He heals a seriously injured young child, and he even heals himself, and he finds his purpose again as a physician. But he's observed by that young child's older sister, who discovers a futuristic patent application date on one of the instruments and grasps the financial opportunities. She blackmails the physician into taking her on as a partner. Together, they start to run a clinic. Soon, there are remarkable stories of this doctor healing patients. But the young woman wants more. She wants to find a way to use this futuristic medical equipment for financial gain. The doctor, however, is altruistic and wants to give the bag over to medical science. They clash, and the tale turns dark. The first 15 stories in the Science Fiction Hall of Fame cover 1934 to 1950. Twelve of the 15 are printed in astounding science fiction, and 10 of the 12 are from when John W. Campbell is editor. This is referred to as the golden age of science fiction. From here on out, we have a number of different magazines and books represented. Born of Man and Woman is a science fiction short story by Richard Matheson, first published in the July 1950 issue of the Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction. It is written in the form of an internal diary in broken English by the protagonist of the story, a protagonist that the reader presumes is a deformed child. We discover that the child is chained in the basement by its abusive parents. Why is this child imprisoned? Why is it not allowed upstairs? What is wrong with this child? You might know Richard Matheson from some of his other work. Many of his stories were adapted, and he worked with Rod Serling on the TV show The Twilight Zone. I Am Legend and The Shrinking Man are two of his novels from the 1960s. He sold this story for publication at the age of 23. We see his knack for science fiction horror and twists that you don't necessarily see coming. So in part two, we've looked at 10 short stories included in the Science Fiction Hall of Fame. These are 10 strong stories. The Weapon Shop shows the weird and wonderful fiction of Van Vogt. Mimsy Were the Borogoves is a clever, well-constructed, well-written story. Huddling Place is marvelous in describing a universe of Martians, humans, and robots. Arena and First Contact are tactical military stories that only a mother, the little black bag, and born of man and woman takes science fiction into the realm of horror. Scanners live in vain. Imagine what it is like to give up so much of your life in service and then be found obsolete. And acclaimed short story writer Ray Bradbury 
gives us Mars as heaven, introducing us to his smooth prose and melancholic stories. It is hard to choose favorites from this list. They are all so good. The Little Black Bag was a new story to me, and I fell into its charm, its characters. And then there was a horrific turn and an ending that I didn't see coming. In part three, we'll look at 10 more science fiction short stories. Do you have any favorite stories from this list? What do you think about Astounding Stories representation in the 1940s? Let me know in the comments below. Until next time, keep reading.